the Framework Laptop, a fully modular, repairable, and upgradable ultra portable laptop. It's a dream product for the right to repair advocates, tinkerers, or just consumers who understand that they actually own the stuff that they purchase and can operate their things any way they choose. However, there's still a not insignificant number of consumers that fit that profile but won't buy a framework until they offer an option other than Intel. If framework can't even fully appeal to its base consumers, how can it broaden its market presence to the average consumer who has no idea or doesn't even care about right to repair or consumer rights? Especially with the strong competition from AMD and Apple chipping away at the market share, will Intel be the death of framework? It's the money. Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ and across all the content I've made on the framework laptop, the most frequent comment I get is, when are they gonna make a Ryzen version? For the record, I don't know. I don't actually have a professional relationship with framework outside of customer, company. I have been daily driving the framework laptop for over a year now, and I even upgraded to the 12th gen Intel mainboard. In my initial review of the framework, I actually said that Intel Tiger Lake CPU was a great choice for the framework based on my use case. However, after using it for a year, upgrading to Alder Lake and testing both the Ryzen 6800U ThinkBook and the new M2 MacBook Air, I definitely feel the need for options other than Intel. Now, to be clear, I bought the framework and will continue to support them because I personally believe in the company and their vision of a fully repairable and upgradable ultra portable laptop. And knowing the industry like I do, I can hazard to say that this laptop wouldn't exist without Intel. Just forget for the moment how AMD is currently handing Intel its ass in the desktop, mobile, and even enterprise spaces, and keep in mind how much bigger of an animal Intel is as a corporation. Like any company, Framework needed assistance from its component partners to get this laptop off the ground, and Intel has an immensely larger development team that's able to work directly with Framework engineers to get the laptop developed and working. In fact, I'd guess that the 12th gen version of the framework was probably almost completely developed before the first 11th gen laptop was even sold a year ago. AMD's development team is infinitesimally smaller and therefore limited to the number of manufacturers they can work with. There's also the problem of supply. Framework couldn't have offered a Ryzen 6000 series laptop or mainboard alongside the Intel 12th gen because the supply just isn't there. Three weeks ago when I was looking for a Ryzen 6800U laptop, this Lenovo ThinkBook was the only one on the entire internet. Today there's just this and sporadically you can find an Asus ZenBook 13. If the big boys are having trouble sourcing Ryzen CPUs for their ultra portables, there's no way framework can. Again, I have no inside information on that, just some knowledge of the industry, and that's my educated guess on why there's no AMD framework yet. And really, does there need to be? Is the Ryzen-powered ThinkBook or this MacBook Air, for that matter, that much better than the framework laptop? Well, let's find out. All the tests were done with the laptops plugged in and on best performance mode. If you're interested in the results of all these tests for the Lenovo and framework on battery at the different power windows settings, you can check out my review of the ThinkBook listed in the description. And as far as the MacBook, it performs exactly the same whether plugged in or on battery. And right off the top, we'll start with performance and I'll start with the headline grabbing benchmarks. In a single Cinebench R23 run, we see the Ryzen 6800U powered Lenovo pulls ahead of the 1260p framework by 11% while the framework beats the M2 MacBook Air by 17% in multi-core performance. However, if we increase the run times to 10 minutes, surprisingly, the passively cooled MacBook suffers the least with its score dropping only 5.6% while the framework drops by over 10% and even the pretty efficient Ryzen dropped 21.5% to now fall behind the framework. In an average of three blender runs, the Lenovo pulls ahead of both the framework and the Mac by 14 to 15% as the latter two are neck and neck in this test. 
Looking at the more practical workload simulations in Geekbench, the framework takes a 3 and 2% lead over the Lenovo and MacBook in multi-core performance. In single-threaded performance, the framework has up to a 10% lead in Cinebench, but in Geekbench single-core performance, the MacBook comes out on top with an 11% advantage over the framework, while the framework shows an 11% higher score than the Lenovo. So those are workloads that these thin and light laptops really weren't designed for, but they can give us an idea of how these systems will perform in real world workloads. So let's move on to those real world workloads. Starting with video editing, which again, isn't what these lower powered CPUs are really well suited for. Well, usually, Looking at a very traditional Premiere Pro workflow using the Puget Bench test, we see that the Intel framework with its well-optimized quick sync support still outperforms the Ryzen laptop, but not by much. AMD with its powerful RDNA 2 based iGPU is starting to catch up, but the Apple Silicon with its next level media engine just kills it, beating the 12th gen Intel by almost 50%. Now, switching to DaVinci Resolve, I put together three real world projects. Test video one consisted of over 34K clips I took directly from my cell phone and cut into a 1080p timeline with no grading or effects, just a handful of simple transitions. Video two is the same 10 minute video, but this time on a 4K timeline with some moderate grading, audio work, several more complex transitions, a second audio backing track, and several text overlays. The third video is one of my actual 10 minute channel video projects and consists of 6K Blackmagic Raw, ProRes 422, 8 bit H.264, and H.265 clips with lots of grading, effects, audio work, text, and animations. And I tweaked the project so it will render on all three laptops. If you saw my previous video on that framework 12th gen upgrade, this is the render that failed. It turned out it was a custom LUT causing the problem. I fixed it. Anyway, we see looking at the render times of the three projects, again, the MacBook is killing it, rendering out all three 128% faster than the framework, and the Lenovo is about 25% faster thanks to its beefier iGPU. Now, I've always said render times aren't the be all end all when it comes to performance. Despite the render times, it turns out that the framework actually has much better timeline performance than the Lenovo with smooth scrubbing and playback while the Lenovo is choppy and drops frames. Of course, the MacBook is flawless when it comes to timeline performance, even able to handle some grades and transitions. Now let's move on to what these small to medium business laptops were made for, and that's productivity work. Testing a number of tasks in Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, and Intel shows why it's still very relevant in this arena, taking a 36 and 27% lead over the Ryzen and M2 laptops respectively. And if we look at photo editing capabilities in Photoshop and Lightroom, we see the framework is 26% faster than the Lenovo and even beats the MacBook, which is very well optimized on the Adobe suite. In code compilation, we see the framework land in the middle of the pack, 48% behind the Mac and 17% ahead of Lenovo. Now switching to graphics performance, one of the big reasons people are looking for a Ryzen option in the framework, and we see the Lenovo take a huge 98% lead in OpenCL performance over the framework, and the M2's eight core GPU performs 36% better. Considering OpenCL support was depreciated on Mac since like 2018, if we run the test using the Metal API, the Mac pulls even farther ahead. Looking at the 3D Mark cross-platform benchmark Wildlife Extreme, the Mac shows that it has the potential to be a better gaming system than both the PCs, and looking at an actual game benchmark, it looks like the performance of the MacBook Air is really close to Lenovo. But if you look closer, you see that the M2 is GPU bound only 20% of the time, meaning the CPU is not able to feed the GPU fast enough, resulting in very choppy gameplay. The Ryzen is a little better, but still full of stutters, while the framework turns out has the most smooth and consistent gameplay of the three laptops at least in this game. However, none of these laptops is really intended for gaming outside of your less demanding esports or arcade style games. The 6800U does have the potential to be a good low resolution gaming CPU, but not at the package power restrictions imposed on this laptop by its cooling solution. So after all those charts, the bottom line is while the Ryzen has much better graphics horsepower and the MacBook with its next level media engine can out video edit even some full on thick boy laptops, 
for what it's really intended for productivity work the framework actually performs the best and therefore a ryzen option really isn't pressing to have not to mention the expandability options that come with the uh, intel like the four thunderbolt ports that yes are configurable via the expansion cards but offer a massive amount more expansion possibilities other than the one usb4 port on the lenovo and usb4 isn't even offered on all ryzen 6000 series laptops while the macbook does have two thunderbolt 4 ports so has plenty of options for docks and storage expansions unlike the pcs it doesn't support an external gpu Here's where I need to make a correction to my review of the ThinkBook. While Lenovo clearly identifies the rear USB port as the USB 4 port, it's not. The forward one is in fact the USB 4.0 port, not the USB 3.2, so I was able to connect and use my eGPU with an RX 6600 installed and the stock Lenovo graphics driver. Okay, moving on to the final stat that takes all the positives about the framework and puts them on the back burner and blows that little conclusion I just made out of the water battery life and power efficiency looking at the underwriter laboratory's battery life test the framework performs poorly for an ultra portable laptop with almost four hours less battery life than the lenovo and half a day less than the macbook now to be clear this test does favor the macbook as it's able to offload the video playback to its media engine therefore we were using significantly less power but it still looped the video for 39 minutes longer than the lenovo did doing nothing at idle i didn't even bother with an idle test for the macbook because well i didn't have two days to kill i get comments all the time like i'd love six hours of battery life my five-year-old so-and-so laptop only gets two which is great that's a big improvement for you but the bigger point is it's 2022 and these exist in the same space i compare current products to their current competition Anyway, to compare the efficiency, let's look at just power usage during the third Resolve video render job. And you see, for the same job, not only did the Ryzen do it 29% faster, it did it using 29% less power. Now, unfortunately, power metrics on the Mac wouldn't spit out the numbers for this graph, but I did screen record the entire test, and the M2 package power stayed between just 7 and 8 watts during the entire test. So, the MacBook finished the render 51% faster using 73% less power. But of course, the MacBook could have done better, right? I mean, Apple couldn't even spend the engineering time or money to put a better heat sink on it, so now it thermal throttles. Well, first, not news. Every MacBook Air ever thermal throttles. The M1 Air throttles, the Intel MacBook Airs throttle. It's a trade-off for a 12 millimeter thin, two pound light, completely silent laptop and second so does the framework the 1260p throttled during that same resolve render first let me show you what a non-throttling workload looks like this is the 6800u doing the resolve render the blue line is the average cpu frequency which trends right around 1500 megahertz range which is fine as a bulk of the work is on the integrated graphics and as the cpu intensive elements come up text transition stills the cpu boosts up to accomplish that work in some cases the temp the orange line jumps with the cpu load but overall temps stay below 75 celsius now looking at the same job by the framework and it's not as clean the frequency is a little more sporadic because we're dealing with the p and the e cores but the temperature very quickly gets up to over 90 degrees and then continues to spike to 100 and then drop back down to 92 or 93 spiking right back up to 100 it even spikes above 100 several times and here we don't necessarily see cpu throttle rather it shifts the work from the p to the e cores but after we pass about the halfway point the laptop is completely heat soaked and the cpu no longer has the thermal headroom it needs to boost and in a couple of places where it really needs the p core cpu performance it unfortunately does throttle again i don't have the numbers for the macbook and while asatop did indicate it throttled during the resolve render the temp never exceeded 85 degrees and from observing the frequencies 
there looked to be a good trade off between the P and E cores with the P cores maintaining 2.3 to 2.6 gigahertz and the E cores average somewhere around 1.6 gigahertz. Now with poor efficiency, heat that actually caused the laptop to get too hot to touch and bad battery life, the framework is also just loud. Just small upticks in activity really caused the fans to ramp up even when I'm just working in a Microsoft Office app in balanced or even best efficiency mode, some background process will kick in and the laptop will sound like it's about to take off. So I guess my point is the Alder Lake CPU performs really well unfortunately it requires way too much power and generates way too much heat to do so and that isn't an ideal solution for a thin and light laptop now i'm not going to do a deep feature to feature comparison of these three laptops i've done two reviews of the framework and i just reviewed the lenovo a couple of weeks ago and i will be reviewing the macbook air alongside the base model 14 inch macbook pro that's currently on sale for the same exact price that i paid for this so be sure to get subscribed so you don't miss that. But I will say with these three, you get what you pay for in terms of features. The Lenovo is a lesser laptop than the framework. It has a worse display, keyboard, trackpad, camera. The microphones are about equal. The only thing that's probably better are the speakers, but it also costs about $400 less. Everything on the MacBook is arguably better than the framework, except the keyboard, but that's subjective. I like the framework slightly larger and spread out keys, the longer key travel and softer bottom out. I know people think it's mushy, which is fair, but moving between a mechanical keyboard with silent tactile switches to the framework is less jolting, I'll just say. As far as upgradability and repairability, of course, nothing comes close to the framework. As far as these two, they're actually pretty close. While nothing on the MacBook is upgradable, the only thing on the Lenovo is the SSD. As far as repairability, just judging from the iFixit teardown, the MacBook might be more so than the Lenovo. Now, regardless of my criticism of the framework, almost all of which is solely focused on Intel, I'm still sticking with it as my daily driver. The Lenovo, I'm donating to a local family in need, and the MacBook, well, either it or the MacBook Pro is going back to Apple, depending on the results of my next video, but mostly, I'm sticking with the framework because like I said in my six month review, the framework laptop might not be the best laptop currently available, but framework is the best company currently making laptops. And I'm not gonna let weak hardware from the gargantuan Intel be the reason I stopped supporting a small startup company. But I understand the problem of the market position of the second, let alone third best option. I'm finding it harder and harder to recommend the framework to average users when these options exist. I'm also concerned that if Intel keeps going down the road of power thirsty hot CPUs to try to match or surpass Ryzen's performance, Framework won't be able to effectively cool them or incorporate them into the current chassis. So if Intel doesn't make progress in the efficiency department, like make the efficiency cores actually efficient, I definitely think Framework has to make strong efforts to develop solutions with other suppliers. But what do you think? Is Intel hindering the full potential of framework? Sound off in the comments. I really wanna hear from all you who really wanna support framework, but won't buy an Intel version. While you're down there, be sure to hit that like and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next one.